Welcome back to Making Sense of Money, a podcast dedicated to taking tough financial topics and making them easier to understand. I'm Andrew Pellegrini. And I'm Nikki Jancola Shanks. Today, I'm very excited to introduce our special guest, Brian Gorman from the Illinois Department of Insurance. Brian is a director of outreach and engagement for Get Covered Illinois, and he's here to talk to us about this very important program. Brian also recently co-hosted a webinar with Andrea and I on health insurance, so make sure to check that out as well. We will put the link in the show notes. On a personal note, I have had the pleasure of working with Brian on and off in a variety of roles since 2010, so I'm very happy to get him on the pod. Brian, welcome, and can you please introduce yourself for our listeners? Hi, Nikki. Hi, Andrea. My name is Brian Gorman. I am the Director of Outreach and Consumer Education for Get Covered Illinois. Get Covered Illinois is a business unit within the Illinois Department of Insurance, and it's our job to help educate and enroll Illinois consumers who need to uh, enroll in a ACA or an Affordable Care Act health plan. So really excited to be here. Thank you, Brian. So you said that Get Covered Illinois is a business unit, but can you describe, like, isn't it also a program that consumers can take advantage of? Can you kind of elaborate on that aspect of it? Yeah, absolutely. And, and Get Covered is essentially known as the state's official health insurance marketplace. Back when the ACA was formed in, in 2010, states had a decision to become either what they call a federally facilitated marketplace or a state-based marketplace. And Illinois at the time chose to become an FFM or a federally facilitated marketplace. And we use uh, healthcare.gov. But we also knew that we needed to have some sort of extension of outreach, public education, and a way for Illinois consumers to better access the opportunities that were provided under the ACA. So back in now 2012, under previous governor, Pat Quinn, Get Covered Illinois was created. And, and for the last 10 years, we've been doing our best to educate folks and, and getting them enrolled uh, in a plan. So Get Covered Illinois is really your program, Brian, right? Like that's the program that does all the outreach, but the health insurance plans themselves is what the federal government is in charge of, correct? Exactly. So it's, we don't, we are not a health insurance plan. We are a government funded program, which helps educate consumers on what they need to do. And we provide resources for people who are are looking to make that um, decision. So when you go to Get Cover Illinois, you'll be shopping from insurance companies who are on the marketplace. So Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Aetna, Celtic, these are some of the branded um, insurance companies which you'll have access to through Get Covered Illinois, but we are not a health insurance program or Medicaid or or Medicare. We are distinctly different from them. That's a great point. Very, very interesting. So as you mentioned, Get Covered Illinois was born from the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as the ACA. Fun fact, that's actually how Brian and I first met and worked together. But anyway, (laughs) um, under that act, certain uh, what's called essential health benefits are now guaranteed to get covered. Can you tell us what those are and and why that was such a big deal? I think that's a great question. And and I think it would be helpful just to kind of step back for a second and look at what the Affordable Care Act is. You know, it's been since 2010 when this was passed and it's there's been a norming process that people kind of understand. They think they know what the ACA is and it's got covered. It's the marketplace. It's the way you can select Medicaid plans, but it, it is the Affordable Care Act is so much more. And it, and it was two things. One, it was the creation of health insurance marketplaces where Illinois consumers or consumers around the country could better shop for and compare plans and find out what they might be eligible for. And with those plans in the ACA, there are tax credits, and I'm sure we'll get into those shortly, but to help people make those premiums. But also part of the ACA, people forget there's a a series of insurance reforms on insurance companies, which essentially did away with some of the the worst practices by insurance companies and standardized the way that health insurance plans were offered to consumers. So we knew exactly what you're going to get. Now, you had mentioned that that there are um, essential health benefits, and then that's a, one of the key components of marketplace plans or ACA plans, is that there are 10, what they call 10 essential health benefits, and there are categories where every single 
plan is sold. So you know that if you purchase a plan through Get Covered Illinois or through healthcare.gov, that hospitalization will be covered. Your emergency room visits will be covered. Prescription drugs covered. Lab services covered. Um, we call those essential health benefits. And in addition to those benefits, there's also access to free preventive care. So obviously now more than ever, people need to go see their general practitioner at least once a year. They need to get vaccinated. And all of those are covered free of charge to anyone who is enrolled in an ACA plan. Thank you, Brian. I know another big part of the ACA legislation had to do with pre-existing conditions. Mm-hmm. How did the Affordable Care Act change insurers' approach to pre-existing conditions? You know, it's it's remarkable. Uh, it's been so long now, but the idea that you could attempt to enroll as a woman in a health insurance plan and say, well, you know, um, it looks like you're, you want to select this plan, but let's look at your health history. Oh, you have a, a series of, of kidney issues past or interested in, in starting your own family and you may be too expensive to cover. So we need to do one of two things. This is obviously in the past. They could either charge you more for this very same plan that me as a man with no history could be charged or worse they could deny you coverage and say, you know what, we've, we've run your numbers through our system. You're going to be way too expensive for us to cover. It's not worth it for us. So go out someplace else and, and find a more expensive plan or, or most cases, people with really difficult health circumstances just didn't have coverage at all. And it was the number one driver of bankruptcy was health insurance bills because people were walking around sick and unable to um, to see a doctor. And so the ACA, when it was passed, said, okay, in addition to creating these marketplaces where people can get access to coverage, increase Medicaid access for those clients who meet a certain income threshold, we said, stop. We are no longer going to allow insurance companies to decide who they cover. So now the only thing that insurance companies can ask is, how many people live in your household? Where do you live? And are you a tobacco user? And they don't differentiate between whether you're a man or a woman, if you have a, a chronic condition, if you're obese, or if you're a, a marathon or a runner, we're all treated uh, equally. And, and that has actually proven to be a really, very really helpful business model for insurance companies. And obviously, it's much better for consumers as well. Yeah. So I actually was thinking about us, Brian, and the work that we did way back when with mm-hmm. healthcare stuff, when I was pregnant with my daughter, because I was like, oh. Yeah, I could have very easily been denied health insurance in the past, which I never even really crossed my mind until I was experiencing it. And I do remember as well, my mom had open heart surgery when she was 50 and I, it was before the ECA was passed and it was terrifying for her. Cause she was like, I'm never going to, I have to stay at my job for like no insurance company's ever going to insure me again. And now, you know, that's something else you didn't have to to worry about because of this piece of legislation. So I think that it is true what you say, Brian. I think when you think back, like 2010 doesn't seem that long ago, but when it comes to this stuff, that is a long time that people have now had that benefit and they, they kind of forgot that they used to not. And, and I, you know, I know that the title of this, this podcast, the theme is, is, is making sense of money. And one of the unintended consequences of this legislation is that people are now to make free to make entrepreneurial decisions or decisions on their career based on what their skill set is, what they want to do and the choices they make, not about the benefits and health insurance that your company has. So people were anchored to these unsatisfactory professional circumstances because they were fearful that if they left their job, they would lose their health insurance coverage. So now people are actually free to, to become entrepreneurs, get a plan in the marketplace if they don't get co- sponsored coverage. And there's a more dynamic nature to the environment as well. So there have been very intentional reasons why the ACA passed and has been so successful. I just don't think that people talking about enough the, the freedom of knowing that you're not uh, one job decision away from losing your health insurance and, and, and going into bankruptcy or worse, getting sick. Yeah. And I also know that from the beginning, there's always been some sort of tax incentive with Get Covered Illinois or the Affordable Care Act, however. Can you just kind of explain that and how does it help people? Well, obviously, one of the the largest barriers to affordability 
was that they were really expensive. I mean, health insurance plans are, are really pricey. And, and that's why people generally want to get them through their insurance, so they're through their employer, where they make a small contribution, the employer picks up the rest, and it's more affordable. But obviously, when you're on the individual market, you're, some of these plans can be in excess of $1,000 per person per month. So when the law was designed, it was created with what we call advanced premium tax credits or APTCs. And these are tax credits that are issued in the beginning of the plan year that you use to cover the cost of your premiums each month. And 86%, I believe last year, 86% of Illinois consumers received some form of APTC to help offset the cost of their insurance plans each month. And some people are paying as low as $50, $60, $70 a month for plans that may cost in excess of $1,000. It's important to note that those tax credits are on a sliding scale. So if you're closer to, say, 400% of the federal poverty level for a family of four, your tax credits will be significantly lower than those individuals who are, say, maybe a family of four making $50,000 a year. So they tried to create a formula which is more helpful for uh, people to make those affordability. There's also other men's affordability as well, where we call them um, cost sharing reductions. And if some people qualify for those as well, which help with your co-insurance, if that's part of your plan, or your co-pays at a reduced level. So there's a number of different financial tools available through the ACA to help people make their premium payments and make them more affordable. Thank you, Brian. Also, due to COVID and the American Rescue Plan, I think the federal government expanded some of these tax benefits that you've talked about. Can you tell us about these more recent changes? In March of 2021, the federal government passed and and President Biden signed into law the American Rescue Plan, which provided significantly improved tax benefits to consumers who were on the marketplace. So it actually increased the amount of tax credits available to help folks pay their premiums and also extended two things as people who are on that subsidy cliff at the end end of the 40%, they moved that along so more people got coverage. And most significantly, in my opinion, was establishing a cap of 8.5%. Uh, 8.5% is the maximum amount of money that a household will spend on insurance costs in any given year or healthcare costs altogether. So that includes your premiums, that includes your co-pays, that includes your out-of-pockets. Nobody will spend more than 8.5%. So there's a, a knowing that things went terribly wrong for our family in terms of like our health needs. At least we wouldn't spend more than 8.5%. That was down from, from 10%. Now, those tax credits were due to expire this year, and fortunately, there was the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, or the IRA, which established for at least for another couple of years those tax credits into law. So there's a lot of benefits that have been building on them to make them more affordable. We do know, even with all these tax credits, that affordability is a huge barrier for a lot of people. So we're excited that the federal government and and Congress and the Biden administration are doing their part to help at least improve those situations. And then on the flip side of things, I remember there's, isn't there something about a tax penalty for people who don't have health insurance? Yeah. So the, the individual mandate, dun, 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 everybody was all worked up (laughs) over the the mandate or as it's known, I believe in the law, the the personal responsibility provision. And, And that was an element, interestingly enough, historically, of Governor Mitt Romney from Massachusetts when they went into the passage of their own version of this, this you know, the, the basis for a lot of these ACA policies was that, yes, everybody is guaranteed issue, which means that you have to, insurance companies must provide enrollment for anybody that wants it. But insurance companies came back and said, well, if we got to cover everybody, then we need to make sure that everybody's in. During the Trump administration, that personal responsibility provision or the individual mandate was eliminated. And it was no longer required that people enroll in a a health insurance plan. And certainly there are a lot of people who no longer are enrolled that were enrolled because they don't have to do it anymore. But it's always been the position of Get Covered Illinois and our partners that we wanted to incentivize people to enroll, one, because it's more affordable if they know that there's help to, to help pay for them, 
But two, we, we want people to remind that how important it is to have health coverage, where you know that you're only one trip to the hospital from going bankrupt or understanding the benefits of uh, knowing as maximum amount of money that you're going to be spending each year, or just the importance of going to see your doctor and getting vaccination. So while we were disappointed and found the, the individual mandate helpful, we believe that people can understand the importance of having health insurance the same way without that. So we've seen those numbers grow up dramatically in the last couple of years. Thank you, Brian. So we've been talking about the marketplace. Can you kind of talk about who should be using it? Is it open to everyone? The marketplace is a resource available to individuals who are under the age of 65. So if you're currently on Medicare, the marketplace is not for you. Medicaid, Medicare is, is, is your program. You need to be legally present to be eligible for the, for the subsidies uh, on the marketplace. And you must not be offered employer-based coverage. So for example, I work for the state of Illinois. I get health insurance through my employer. I would not be eligible for marketplace coverage. It's, it is designed for people who don't have the offer of affordable, again, it needs to be less than 8.5%, affordable employer-based coverage who are small businesses, self-employed. And then of course you need to meet certain income thresholds to receive those tax credits. So it is open to everyone provided that you are a legal permanent resident. If you're currently not on Medicaid, Medicare, or receive employer-based coverage. And, and you know, last year, more than 346,000 people just in the state of Illinois alone were able to enroll in those plans. That's great. Now that we know who should can shop on the marketplace, when can they enroll in the marketplace? Open enrollment for the marketplace typically begins on November 1 of the calendar year for plans starting the following January. So the upcoming open enrollment for next year will start November 1, 2023, and that will begin plans that start on January 1, 2024. So there are a lot of opportunities for people to select plans, and most people do select their plans during that period from November 1 through January 15th. However, uh, there are a number of what we call qualifying life events that trigger a special enrollment period. And examples of, of those SEPs or special enrollment periods would be if you got married, you had a birth of a child, adoption of a child, if you got divorced, if you moved from your area, those would all provide folks, regardless of where they were in the calendar year, the opportunity to enroll in a, in a marketplace plan. And obviously another example of, of SEP there are a whole host of people who are going to be removed from the Medicaid rolls this coming year. Ending of the public health emergency has triggered what we think is a very significant shift in how people receive health coverage throughout the state, where they have not been giving determinations on whether they're eligible or not. So over the next 12 to 15 months, there are potentially hundreds of thousands of people who are no longer going to be eligible for, for Medicaid who will have to enroll in, in a marketplace plan. So there are opportunities outside of that traditional November 1 through January 15th to enroll, but that's mostly when most individuals do enroll. So on the, the Get Covered Illinois website, it talks about different plan categories. Can you tell us what these categories are and how they differ? So you're referring to the, the metal levels that oftentimes when people select plans, you're choosing from a, either a bronze, a silver, a gold, or even a, a platinum plan. And I, candidly, I, I think it's an unfortunate description of, of what these plans are because it, people think, well, I would rather have platinum than have bronze. And the reality is that all the plans are equal in quality based upon those essential health benefits and whatever it may be. The, the differences between them is just based on how much you and your plan split the costs. So for example, a bronze plan would have a lower premium each month, but would have higher out-of-pocket costs to actually utilize that plan. Whereas a platinum plan or a gold plan would have extremely high premiums each month, but the amount of that comes out of your pocket is a lot less when you go to use your insurance. And so as the, the shopping experience for people who are thinking, okay, with how much health insurance do I plan on using next year? It defines where you want to go. 
I will say that there is one difference I think is important for individuals to know is there's a thing called a silver plan. And that's kind of the, the, the moderate middle of the road area. And that's where you're most likely to find the highest tax credits to help make your payments, but also where you can get your those cost sharing reductions to offset your co-pays, your co-insurance. And so, you know, again, the important thing is for folks to shop around and, and assess what you think you might need. Someone who perhaps is going to be using a lot of health insurance over the course of the year might want to consider paying more in a premium so they pay less out of pocket. But someone who's younger and healthier and, and really just wants insurance for the preventive care and then the risk of insurance may be more attracted to the bronze plans. I think that makes good sense, Brian. And it's basically part of your risk management assessment to determine which, like what bronze, silver, gold, metal might be best. It's based on risk, not really quality. Right. Right. So I wish that they would A, B, C, D or. Yeah. I do agree with you because when I first went on the website and I was looking at the plans, I was like, oh, so gold's got to be the best plant, right? And it's really what's best for you. It's not necessarily the best healthcare plan. Right. It's not quality. It's just how you and the insurance company split the costs. That's a great way to put it. Also on the website, there's a lot of information about different plan types, such as an HMO and a PPO. And I know that this can be its own separate podcast on the differences between these two types. But can you just kind of give us a brief overview of them and how they differ just a little bit. And can you get only one type on the exchange or are all HMOs and PPOs available? And I think that these two categories also suffer from the better or worse variety of them. And there's reasons why someone may select one or the other. So let me just kind of break it down the best I can so people kind of understand the difference and know that there's not one better or worse for you or your family. It's just there's different categories to give you some choice. One is called the PPO, which is the Preferred Provider Organization. And that's the type of plan that allows you to use doctors both in and out of a network. We all have this kind of network of, of providers that we work out of. And a PPO, those plans will allow you to, to use doctors both inside and, and outside a network without a referral. An HMO is a, is a health management organization. And typically that is a plan where you get you need to get most of your care provided that you don't ha have a medical emergency from a specific network of doctors within a hospital system for, for, for lack of a better term. And oftentimes when you go to see a specialist, you need to get a referral from your primary care physician to see that particular specialist. The question is, you know, is a PPO or an HMO better? The answer is no. It, it all depends on, on what you're looking for. I mean, a PPO would be a better choice if you're looking for more flexibility in the doctors you see, if you don't mind paying a little more, because obviously with that flexibility comes an increased cost for both you and, and your insurance company. And then you want to see a doctor without a referral. An HMO might be a better choice if you like lower costs each month, or you don't have a strong preference upon a specific network of doctors. You just want to make sure that you can go see someone each year. And then you don't, you don't mind having to just take a pause and, and get something in the network. So again, there are hundreds of different plans that are available through the marketplace, a lot to choose from different metal levels, different types of plan, a PPO or an HMO. It all just depends on, on what's best for you and your family. I feel like this is very helpful for me as open choice period for for my department <laughs> from my university is coming up. I'm like, oh yeah, that's the difference between HMO and PPO. Thank you, Brian. So uh, one of the other tools that people can use is a health savings account. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what they are and if they are available on the marketplace? Right. So they, these are like, these are programs that kind of exist that, that allow people to access Pay, way to pay for their care pre-tax. And they're mostly common with employer-based coverage as well, but there's different savings accounts or, or HMAs that, that they're called. Important thing is that they are issued pre-tax so you don't get paid it after the fact. Um, and people often use them for things like purchasing eyeglasses or their, their co-pays each month. Again, this is an example of like, there's just a variety of different plans that, that may not work for everyone. And I think 
it's a good time to remind you and the listeners that as we describe all of these variable different plans, what metal levels they are, what kind of plans they are, that health insurance is extraordinarily uh, non-intuitive and they're complicated and they're difficult to understand. And we want you to know that you're not alone because all of us struggle. Like we've already heard you mention, you selecting the plan. The state has their plan that they're issuing for our employees in, in May. And I get reminders all the time and they puts me in sweats and I'm putting it off for the last minute. But when you purchase a plan through Get Covered Illinois, we have what we call navigators or certified application counselors. These are people who are in your community that work free of charge. So they, they don't get a commission. They don't get paid. They, they exist. Most of them are community-based organizations and they are trained and certified to help walk you through what your best options might be. So I, I do want to plug our, our website real quick while I have everybody's attention is getcoveredillinois.gov. And that's where you would go to find that, that free enrollment help. And while they won't pick a plan for you, they can certainly ask you the right questions and get you to a conclusion where you can select that plan. They don't, they're not like agents or brokers. They don't get commission or they try to sell you a plan. They're just laying out all the options and, and being able to answer your questions. And I'm proud to say that Illinois navigators are known and reputed to be uh, the very best in the country. So if you're listening here in the land of Lincoln, we have free assistance for you. Just go to getcoveredillinois.gov. It's health insurance coaches. They'll exactly. coach you through the process. So, and this is actually something I, I want to highlight because I know that Get Covered Illinois is really focused on this, that I, I just want to reiterate, and Brian, you could correct me if I'm wrong, but navigators are actual in-person help people. This is not a call center that you are going to call and then wait on hold forever and then now feel like you're never speaking to anybody and getting help that you need. This is actually like the exact opposite of that, correct? Yes, correct. You can make an appointment through our website to see them in person. You can set up a Zoom call or a video call. You can talk over the phone to someone who can, can help you. If you speak a language other than English, you can clarify what you feel you're most comfortable with, and we can find you assistance in your neighborhood. And they are most of these folks are invested in the community as well. So you are correct. It is not a call center to some place in um, Middle America or overseas. These are people that are working in your community who are certified and trained by the Illinois Department of Insurance to provide enrollment assistance free of charge to the consumer. So it's an amazing program. We know how effective it is, consumer assistance is, to getting people to enroll, to retain, and ultimately to use their health insurance. And, um, you know, we're really proud of what we got. But yeah, that's a great point is that it's not just a call center. These are people who have been certified by the department to provide services here in Illinois. Thank you, Brian. So we've been talking a lot about Get Covered Illinois. And can you talk about how Get Covered Illinois differs from other state programs? Well, Get Covered Illinois, again, is, is, a, is a public education and consumer assistance endeavor within the Department of Insurance. But we work very closely with other partners throughout state government that provide different services. For example, there are more than a million individuals who receive their health insurance coverage through Medicaid. Again, one of the really great things about the passage of the Affordable Care Act was the expansion of Medicaid to childless adults who met a certain income threshold. Back in the day, if, if you were just a, a regular old guy who made less than $22,000 a year, you couldn't afford health insurance, you were out of luck because you didn't have kids. It was only available to, to moms and babies. And that was like the name of the program at, at the time. And HFS, our colleagues, the Healthcare and Family Services is, a, is an amazing agency. They have tons of programs, all kids, which essentially provides health insurance coverage to children who are up to 300% of the federal poverty level. Just last year, they had a program for uh, senior citizens of undocumented that they were able to, to retain coverage. So there's a number of different programs that you can get through as well through HFS if you meet the income threshold. And of course, our partners at Aging assist with uh, the SHIP counselors, that's S-H-I-P, counselors to help senior citizens enroll in Medicare programs. So 
we have a small but very important role to play to making sure that across the state, regardless of your economic circumstances, your um, your documentation status, your age, that you have the health coverage that you and your family need. And, and But we do work very closely with our partners across all agencies. That's great, Brian. And I know that you had kind of thrown out a number um, earlier in this podcast, mm-hmm. but I just wanted to kind of highlighted again. Can you tell our listeners what enrollment is like for Get Covered Illinois? It is robust. Business is booming. Um, We have a very, very healthy insurance marketplace. We're seeing the number one, the number of carriers grow in state to to 11 this past year. That's from top to bottom. All areas of the state have 11 insurance carriers, but uh, there are tons of options for each area across the state. And we saw a 6% growth from the previous year to 346,000 enrollees in the marketplace. And those are people who have selected a plan. So we're seeing growth both in the competitiveness of the marketplace for insurance companies and the number of people who want to purchase plans. I think that's part and parcel to two things. One, obviously we have a, a robust consumer assistance and marketing program to let people know what their options are. But the increased tax credits and affordability, also an incentive to consumers. I mentioned 86% of the Illinois consumers who are in the marketplace out of that 346,000 receive some sort of tax credit to help make them premium payments each month. And and many of them, a vast majority, are are less than $100 a month. So the incentive for people to enroll exists in the affordability, but also the the understanding that, that insurance is vital particularly coming out of a, a pandemic and a public health emergency for, for the health security of, of you and your family. So we're excited where we're going. We expect that to continue to grow um, modestly year after year as people kind of f- familiarize themselves with what it is that we do. So Brian, as we've already established, we could probably talk about health insurance concepts all day long, all week long, because it's very complicated. But very our, exciting. Very it's very exciting. exciting. Very complicated. There's some changing things all the time. But can you give us any final thoughts you would like our our listeners to have, right? As as they move into their health insurance journey or continue it, hopefully. Yeah, and and that is great. There's there's two things that I'd like to, to point out. One, it's a lot more affordable than people think. I think that there is a myth of the the young, invincible health insurance consumer that, you know, that people think that there's people out there that don't think they need health insurance. And that's actually not the case. The barrier to getting people covered has always been affordability. So it's our job to, in addition to providing resources to help folks enroll, is to let people know that there's financial help to make sense what it is that you're doing and to become more affordable. Two, that there is help. We know and we've established through both our our, our webinar series, through our podcasts, through our conversations offline, that there really is nothing intuitive or easy about understanding health insurance. And we've worked very hard to provide resources and information for people to to, to shop for and compare to make the best plans for them and their family. And we find out that people that do get the most information at the front end of their experience are more likely to retain their health coverage throughout the course of the calendar year and do a better job of selecting a new plan in the previous years. It's something that we actively have to do because as we mentioned before, there are a variety of meta levels. There are a variety of different plans, a PPO versus an HMO. And so people, the better educated they are, the better plans they select and and the more financial sense it makes. So those two things, there's there's financial help available and there's help to you enroll as well. And you're you're not alone. Thank you so much for being here, Brian. Uh, This is a great conversation. I think you have always done a great job taking healthcare and all of the concepts around healthcare and making it conversational and fun to listen to. Oh, good. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you guys. And and, um, I just want to remind folks that if you have any questions or information, the best place you can go to is getcoveredillinois.gov. We were definitely going to link that in the show notes. So you guys can check out the show notes and just click, click from there. So I'm sure we'll have Brian on again in the future because health insurance is complicated. (laughs) To our listeners, as always, thank you for tuning in and make sure you like, subscribe, and share this podcast. Thanks for listening.